Audiobooks, they can change your life. For real, they can, they can. Stay tuned to find out how and why coming up in this one. Welcome to Grass-Fed Life. I'm your host, Diego, D-I-E-G-O. Before we jump into today's episode, I just wanted to remind you that tickets for the Growing Your Farm Business Mastermind, hosted out here in Southern California in March at Primal Pastures, are now for sale. If you were thinking about getting the Farm Business Essentials course, well, here's a great way to get a lot of value and get the course in a live in-person workshop and mastermind session included with it. It's an exclusive event with only 30 tickets for sale. Be sure to secure your place by signing up at grassfedlife.co. Today's episode is a fun one because it's the end of the year, but it's a fun one that has some productive value to it. I wanted this one to be light, I wanted this one to be entertaining, but I also wanted you to leave this episode inspired and ready to take some action. And and that action for this one should be around audiobooks, because that's the whole subject of this episode. Today, farmer Scott Hebert and I are talking audiobooks. We're going to each go through five of our favorite audiobooks, why they're our favorites, and why we think you might be interested in them. If you currently don't listen to audiobooks on a platform like Audible, you kind of need to get with the program here. There's so much to offer, and the world's knowledge is literally right there at your fingertips. So if you don't listen to them, I hope this episode convinces you to give audiobooks a try. Let's jump right into this one. It's 10 audiobooks to listen to with your cat when it's snowing. No cat or snowing required. Happy New Year's. So here we are. It's the end of 2018. And I wanted to make this episode a fun episode. And I wanted to talk about something that I've gotten heavily into in the last year and a half. And you're actually somebody who inspired me to get heavy into this subject matter. I remember looking back on Instagram and seeing you posting a lot of the audiobooks that you were listening to. And I'm like, damn, Scott has listened to a lot of audiobooks. How is he listening to this many? And I think we just had a text conversation back and forth about it. And since then, I have gone all in on audiobooks. And honestly, I can't remember what life was like before them. For you, how have audiobooks played a role in your development, both you know, personally, business-wise, and just who you are? Uh, I just made a video about this today. And I think that reading, especially audiobooks, because that's how I ended up consuming books in the most efficient way, was easily the best choice uh, that I've made in my adult life, uh, probably in my entire life. Um, it's helped me with every single part of my life, um, relationships, business, farming, uh, fitness, everything. Like every single part of my life right now has been enhanced through reading books. And that's, it's not, I was never like a big reader in high school. I started reading, um, I started reading more out of high school. And yeah, it's just, it was a total, it was just a complete game changer. Well, it's one of those things, like I listen to a lot of historical biographies and a lot of really famous people that were really successful read a lot. And I'm always like, when are they getting time to read? And for me, you know, as a dad, like my time to read would be at night and I'm falling asleep reading. So prior to getting into audiobooks, like I'd have these Kindle books and I'd buy them and I'd take me forever to get through them. And then I tune into audiobooks and it's like, now I can crank out books like, like yesterday, I listened to a whole audiobook, 10 hours of audiobook in one day and it's done. And it's just a great way, I think, to consume content. I mean, were you a traditional reader before you got into audiobooks? Yeah, but I was the same as you. I was really slow. I probably read, so for the first 10 years, say that I started to read, I probably read one or two books a year and it was slow and painful and I would read like five minutes at a time and not take in the book very much. And then I found out about audiobooks, uh, I don't know, maybe like 2014-ish is when I like really started going deep on it. And then I just, I just, my mind could just take it in so much better and I could definitely listen um, way faster than I could read. And I could listen while I was doing stuff. I could listen while I was driving. I could listen while I was working outside. So it became this thing where 
Uh, it was just so like I can't take my dog for a walk and take a novel with me or a book, right? A physical book. But I can take my dog for a walk, put on an audio book. And, you know, if I take my dog for a walk uh, every week that, or if I take my dog for a walk every day of the week, that's a whole book that I'll finish just by walking my dog. So, yeah, it was a it was a total game changer. Um, the whole audiobook thing. Yeah, and for me as like a reader. Uh, meaning physically reading a book, one issue I would have, and this is good in a way, but it was also hindered me from consuming content is like I ponder when I read. So I'll read a page, really start thinking about the stuff on it and I wander and, you know, 20 minutes goes by and I've read a page and a half out of a book where audiobook, when it's on play and I speed it up, it rolls. And I'm a believer. Now, maybe there's not science to back this up, but like the audio going into my ears straight to my brain connection, I think is way more powerful than me having to read it and have it go into my brain. So having somebody speed read for me is going to do better than me trying to speed read a book. Yeah, I think that humans have always communicated stories. That's what we do. We tell stories. And we've done that traditionally three different ways. We've done it recently with visual stuff, so that would be like TV. We've done it with written word, like books and blogs and all this other type of stuff. But their oldest one is audio. Uh, We were speaking. We were talking. People would um, sit around the campfires and tell stories and stuff, right? Um, Traditionally, like our oral traditions where it was how knowledge was passed down. All our traditional knowledge was passed down. So um, when people think that somehow there's like that reading is superior to listening, I think is kind of a, I think it's kind of a silly argument to make. I think that some people um, would do better by reading. However, their brain works just works better like that. But I think most people could get a ton of value out of listening. It's kind of funny because like I'll I'll talk to some people or like my parents and be like, oh, I'm I'm reading a book and I'm really not reading and I'm listening to the book. And for some reason, I think listening to an audio book, gets kind of downplayed. But it's allowed me to consume a lot of content. Like I've probably listened to over a hundred audiobooks in 2018 and never in 10 years could I read those same books physically. So it's been a game changer for me. And it's so much of a game changer. Like I look forward to driving long distances. I look forward to packing boxes And sometimes at night, at the end of the day, instead of going in and turning on the TV, I'll sit down on the couch with a pair of headphones and listen to a story versus watching a story on TV. Yeah. Did you ever think that that would happen? No. No, I didn't think I'd become this addicted. Like I have a pair of Beats headphones and I can zone out the world. And when I drive, I put them on and a six hour drive that used to be monotonous or terrible. If I drive to Northern California or Phoenix is now just no problem. Like I can crank out a whole book when I drive to Phoenix and it's, it's a whole world that I didn't know existed. And I get audibles emails and I can just tell like that space is blowing up because audible is introducing their originals and there's any type of content you want from romance to self-help to sci-fi to adventure to thriller to biography like the world is there and i think if somebody is not consuming audiobooks at least in some form you're missing out because this is a gift that we have that no other period in history ever had i mean they had books but you got to have the money to buy the books and you, well, you got to have the time to read all the books. And if people are out there listening to this, I mean, most people are doers and they're out in the field. I mean, like you said, walking your dog farming, you're not going to read a novel. Totally. And, um, there's, there's been people throughout history who got read to like Charles Darwin, his wife read him books in the afternoon. That's what they did. He would lay there, sit there in his study and she would read to him. So I don't think that, um, being read a book necessarily is like the newest thing but i also think that it's um i also think that it's a pretty easy step to go from listening to podcasts like the listeners will be into uh listening to an audiobook i mean the biggest turnoff for me in the beginning because i got an audiobook like in 2014 and then i don't think i got another audiobook till 2017 and it was always the price i was like 30 bucks for an audiobook like that's that's crazy and i started to think about it like well Okay, look at what I could get. If I can get one nugget that can change my life in some way 
even if I'm paying $30, but I rarely would ever pay $30 even for an audiobook now, like, isn't that worth more than $30? And there's been so many things I've done, like th through how I portray this podcast, how I have made the Paper Pot Co. site, different things I've done. And a lot of that knowledge is coming out of audiobooks that I've had to spend money for that, but it's advancing me. And if I compare it to like college tuition now, like I almost think like, man, I wish I had just listened to audiobooks for four years instead of going to college. Oh, yeah. I've, I think I've listened to, I think I've personally listened to way more books. I've consumed way more books than someone, than most people going out of college would read. I really think that. I think I'm probably close to, I think over the past, since 2014, I've probably read between two and 300 books. So, yeah, it's just, it was this, but I was the same way when I first started. I thought that I was really hung up on the cost too, that $20 from Audible or whatever it is for a month. And then um, now I don't even think about it. Now, if there's a book that I want, I just buy it. Like it doesn't even, it doesn't even cross my mind that um, even if it, it, even if it might be a flop, it, it doesn't like, that doesn't even, it doesn't bother me anymore. Um, and that's just because I know how, like now that I'm invested into it, I know how much value that I take out of it. And once you get into Audible, there's a lot of creative ways you can get books cheaper than lists. Like Audible always has sales. Like this weekend, they just had four ninety five sale on books. And if you bought five, you got a $5 coupon. They have, you know, three credits for twenty nine ninety nine. So there's ways you can start to play the system to get that twenty nine ninety nine cost down to nine ninety nine. And I think about that like I'm going to go see some Hollywood movie at the movie theater, that's going to cost me 10 bucks, or I can listen to a 10 hour audio book by an expert in some subject or just a great fiction author. And what's going to leave a more lasting impression. And have you, um, have you listened to books twice? Yeah. Yeah, I have. In fact, s s to prepare for this, some of these books I've listened to, I went back and re-listened to again, but I will go back and listen to a book multiple times. If, I think the content's really valuable. Like it stands out to me as like, hey, this is, and, and I've listened to enough now to really say, okay, where are the outliers? And there's certain books that I just really enjoyed. And those have been the couple that have made it into the three or four range. Nice. Yeah. I also, th I think that um, when I go back to listen to a book again, that's when I'll kind of do my um, listening. Like you said, you were reading a page before and zoning out and going into whatever dreamland, right? Thinking about stuff. That's when I'll kind of do that on that second pass is, you know, I'll listen to it where maybe I'm the first time I'm usually very engaged with the audio, like I'm thinking about it quite a bit. But the second time that I listen to it, it might be something where if if my mind wandered for five minutes, it's not necessarily going to be the worst thing in the world. And I think that's something that um, people don't necessarily think about is that they're, you know, that they're possibly going to listen to this two or three times. And I definitely, I did not think that I would be listening to the same. I never thought that I would, first of all, be reading books and I never, or listening to books. I never thought that um, I would be listening to the same book again. <laughs> yeah, which is great. And you can send those books to friends. And, and down here in the States, I don't know if you have it up in Canada, but down here there's an app called Libby and it plugs into the library system. And I can now take audio books out from my local library for free. So I... I audible wishlist them, compare them against Libby. If I can get them out of Libby and check them out for free, I get them on Libby. If I can't, if Libby doesn't have them, then I go to audible, but it's a great way to, to get more. And one, one daunting thing I think about, about audiobooks for somebody maybe starting and you may think, well, is, was this really a problem? And it's like picking where to start because there's so many books out there at this point where you're at, do you, do you seek out stuff that you're like, I should listen to it? Or do you kind of let the books pull you and you discover stuff and find stuff as you need it? Um, I think that sometimes a book will grab you, just fly off the shelf at you for some reason. And it'll be the exact book. And when that happens, I make sure that that book goes to the top of my list. But other than that, for my reason for choosing a book is uh, it usually I have a rule that if I hear it from like three different people that I respect, that's an automatic buy. Like I have to get that. So if I heard, yeah, if I heard three different people talk about the same book and like in three different places, um, that's it. I got to read that book. Doesn't matter what it is. 
Um, so that's how I kind of start making my list. But then other than that, I remember the very first time that um, I was really excited because this book called uh, Grit by Angela Duckworth had come out and um, I had pre-ordered it. And that was the first time that I had heard about an author was writing this book before it came out. And I was like, it was really cool. I got to do the pre-order for it, right? And um, But now that happens all the time. Now I have my favorite authors. So they'll be bringing stuff out and I'll get that. And it's just like, once you start, I think once you get the ball rolling on it, it becomes a lot less daunting because you know which kind of books you like and um, and you know which authors you like. And it, uh, you know, you start getting into, you know, if, if you gave me like two or three good recommendations on books, um, and you recommend me a fourth book, there's probably a good chance it's going to be a good book. So um, I think you just kind of find your people, find your tribe. Are there categories you kind of cluster books in? No, I'm I'm all over. Yeah, I read widely. I read widely um, on purpose. Definitely on purpose. Um, that was one of the tips that I got right away is from um, this author named Ryan Holiday. He said that in one of his blog posts, he said that you should read widely. Uh, not just get, not just be stuck in your own little corner of the world, right? So yeah, no, I read widely. I'm, I think that I think that I kind of have my stuff that I usually tend to sway towards. Like there's definitely some subjects where, you know, I've read like five or 10 books out of different subjects, but I probably have like 10 different subjects that I've read 10 books in. What do you do when you get a stinker? Um, quit. Yeah. Or return it. Yeah, for sure. Especially with audiobooks, there's some, there's some books that do not have good formats for audiobooks. Like I, I like this philosophy called stoicism, but um, all of the books that we have are from ancient guys. And so if you get a bad translation, it can be like, where art thou thy for when who? And it just sounds really weird in like this old, like old timey dialect. Um, so they don't read very well. And also um, for those books in particular, a lot of them are like, they're almost like short um, aphorisms. They're like short little sentences. And so it doesn't read that well. Like if you're listening to an audiobook, you want it to read kind of like, a story more than like short sentences. Otherwise, you can't just jump in and out of it. So there's, I think the format of the book um, matters a lot. But with Audible, you can return books. So yeah, I I quit. If there's a book that I, I'm like, okay, no, this this book doesn't work as an audiobook. Or sometimes you'll get a bad narrator. That doesn't happen very often anymore. But um, sometimes you'll get a bad narrator, bad audio or something. But you can just, yeah, return it. I just, um yeah, just ignore it and move on. What about you? It's kind of my strategy. I mean, what what I'll do is I'll I'll quit it temporarily and go on to something that I'm more excited about because I always have a queue of 15 books in my library on Audible that I have not listened to. And I'm sometimes I think, well, it's just not the right time. You know, I've listened to too many biographies in a row. Uh, another one just isn't working now, and I'll come back and one of the books actually on this list is one that I aborted and I came back to. And when I came back to it, it was a binge for the next few months um, as I went through the whole series. So is I think sometimes, again, it's just right place, right time. And what we're going to do in this one, going beyond the why of audiobooks, is we each brought five books to the table that we think are important. And we're trying to cover a wide variety of subjects. But I look at the books I have on my list as ones that just really stood out to me above and beyond the rest. So if you're looking to get started with audiobooks or looking for some ideas of stuff to listen to this winter, going into the spring, we're going to come at you with 10 different books. Well, hopefully 10. Uh, we'll see if there's any overlap. What's your first one and why did it make it onto the list? Uh, my first book is The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Um, there's a, an economist named Tyler Cohen and he has a uh, he has a quote, a quote, and it's called, a, he calls them quake books. And that's when you read something, and by the end of it, that you're kind of standing in a new landscape. Like the, like the ground that you were standing on is no longer stable. Everything's crumbled around you because it just looks brand new. And um, I think that all the books that I have on my list uh, were quake books for me. They, they really like changed my perception of how I viewed things. But um, The War of Art was one of the very first audiobooks that I listened to. And um, it was something that just totally... It just changed everything for me. Have you listened to that one yet? It's funny because that's the very first audio book I've ever bought on Audible. And I've never listened to the whole thing all the way through. For whatever reason, it doesn't resonate with me. And there's there's certain books like Grit, Angela Duckworth's Grit. Like I get the message right away and I'm like, I don't have that problem. I don't need to listen to a whole book on it. So Stephen Pressfield in The War of Art is, you know, it's overcoming the resistance of pushing through. And I don't have a pushing through resistance problem. So for me to listen to that, it's it's 
doesn't serve a purpose for me, but I think the basis of that book, and I'm like you when I've heard enough people recommend that book, that if you have trouble starting, if you're an artist or a creator or somebody trying to go out there and do things, that book hopefully can talk you out of false starts and push through. I mean, were you somebody that before you heard that, like you had trouble pushing through the resistance? Well, in the book, he 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 calls the primary enemy of the creativity is uh, is resistance. And I thought that I think that what the book did for me was it. I had all these problems, say, yeah, I guess a little bit about I guess I had troubles pushing through, but I didn't. I thought that my problems, I thought that my problems were the problem. But I, once I kind of had this idea of the resistance in my mind, that all these things were the same, um, it became everything became so much easier to deal with because it was like it all just looked like noise now instead of having to identify each little thing as an individual problem. Does that make sense? It does. It does. That was one of the times where um, I just started to see it everywhere. And I mean, like what, creative endeavor, it's not just about he, uh, he's a writer. So he's, it's mostly about it's mostly for writers, but it can be about um, like painting, doing visual arts, doing video stuff or even like entrepreneurship because that's a it's a creative endeavor. Yeah. And it's one of those books that I think if you are new to this space or new to entrepreneurship, and you're coming out of a corporate lifestyle where you've basically been given tasks or you know you kind of have to work within a system it will show you a way to push out of that system um and and I think again like when I discovered it I was already pushing my way out so the part I consumed was like well I got this um, I don't need more of a push. Um, but I have read some of Stephen Pressfield's other works and like, he's good. Like he knows his stuff. He's been in the game forever. He's been screenplay writer, um, on some very famous movies like Legends of Badger Vance. So I like the idea of it. I mean, is when you look at that book, is there a quote or a big takeaway that really stands out? Uh, yeah. To get over the resistance, you have to do the work. That's what you have to do. You have to do the work. You have to do the work and turn pro. So when you're going to be like, if I'm going to be doing my videos or whatever, I have to be professional about it. I have to publish when I say that I'm going to publish. I have to um, try to do the best thing. Like it's not, you're playing for keeps, right? Um, like you're, yeah, you're the man in the arena. You're playing for keeps. So yeah, I think the big part about overcoming resistance is just doing the work. He talks about, um, he talks about in the morning about going through his, um, he goes through like a routine to get ready for writing. And every single day he, um, he shows up at his desk to write. There was, oh, I don't have the quote, but there was um, one one quote that he quoted in the book. <laughs> it was a quote from Somerset Mom and someone had asked him if he, um, if he writes when inspiration strikes. And he said, I only write when inspiration strikes. Fortunately, it strikes every morning at nine o'clock sharp. So I think the big takeaway for me was, um, was that if you're going to do something creatively, it's not just at the whims of anything else. Like you have to be professional and get this done. And especially things like for being like an entrepreneur, like if I have an order of lettuce or whatever that needs to go out, it's not when I feel like doing the lettuce, that lettuce has to go out. So I have to be professional, show up, do the work, overcome that resistance and just get it done. Yeah. And I've actually physically read his book, Nobody Wants to Read Your Shit. And I think it was in that book, he kind of talked about to to write well, you need to write poorly first and meaning on a daily basis and also on an individual session. So if you're sitting down having brain fog, you just start writing. And as you write, your writing will kind of, your mind will unlock itself and get better. And as you do it repetitively, like you'll get better. You see that doing videos. I've seen that doing podcasts. Like the more you get into something, the better it is. And I think so many people now are so afraid that like, I'm not creative. I'm not a good writer. I'm not good at drawing. I'm not good at building a website or marketing or whatever. So they never do it once because they're so afraid of this idea that they have in their head of, of how they're going to come off that they never get that repetition or iteration in to ultimately get better. And I think one Stephen Pressfield tenant is 
that idea of do the work, which I named the podcast after, of put in the time and get the reps in, and that will allow you to improve. But if you never do it, you you're unless you're some god freak and you find the one talent that you have that nobody else has, you're never going to be good at it from out of the gate. And I know just from, you know, recently talking to you about YouTube, I mean, that's how you approach doing your videos. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I just got to do the work, get in the reps and uh, hopefully, hopefully it all works out. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. All right. So with that, I'll transition to my first one. And the way I kind of pick this list is these are books that seem timeless to me. And to me, I think is really important here because these might not find everybody at the right time in life. And one thing that I've struggled with now and really since I've listened to audiobooks is is time. And a lot of these books will fit into like dealing with time. And the first book I have on the list is Essentialism by Greg McCown. And the reason I really liked that book is because I think that book can also be a quake book for a lot of people. He goes out and the basic premises of that book is you need to decide what is most important or essential and put priority on that and that only. And you have the ability to choose what is important versus society choosing what's important for you. And I think for a lot of people, they let social media, they let advertisements on TV, they let the government say like, you need to pay attention to this stuff. And as a result, you know, people don't follow dreams. People don't go the route of the creatives and like Stephen Pressfield and do the work because their lives are so chaotic and so scattered. Have you read that one? Yeah, I actually, I actually remember you posting this and I read it based on one of your recommendations. Um, do you remember what what it was that captivated you to read that book? I don't. I, I, I'm trying to think if I heard that somewhere myself or if I stumbled upon it because um, I have the physical book too and I've gone through the physical book. But I kind of got into this wave of like seeking out these books that I was probably telling myself like it's okay to say no to stuff and I needed outside experts to justify that. And, and Greg McCown did that in that book of this, this philosophy of do less, not more. And, you know, he'll say in that book, like almost everything is unimportant. And if you think about that, just that one statement, almost everything is unimportant. That can rock some people's worlds because we do a lot of stuff. We, we feel like we have to do a lot of stuff. And that book challenges you to look at what you are doing and say, is this truly important for me? And I'm going to deem stuff important for me and you're going to deem stuff important for you. But we're both asking that question and then we're deciding based upon our context. What was your biggest takeaway out of that book? I think it reinforced some of where I was going with my decision making in life, you know, as a dad with three kids, a wife trying to run a business to do the podcast, to do YouTube, like the last few years have been chaotic and it's been a struggle. And like time is the biggest thing that I lack. It's not a money problem I have. It's a time thing. And it's not that I don't have enough time. It's really, I struggle with saying no to certain things to make best use of that time. And I had started to think, okay, I need to get rid of stuff that isn't truly important, truly adding value. So in his book, when he says, you know, things like, how will I feel if I miss this opportunity? Um, Or, if I didn't have this opportunity, how much would I be willing to sacrifice in order to obtain it? And, you know, you and I were talking YouTube before this and I think, okay, like if, if I wasn't doing YouTube videos right now and, and you came up to me and said, Hey, you know, would you start doing YouTube today based upon your current context? Would you do it? I don't know. 
I, like I, I'm at that kind of point in my life where I'm looking at the time I have and how I can allocate my time. I don't know. So I look at those types of takeaways of going to what is essential and eliminating everything else. And he stresses a ruthlessness in this. Like it's, you don't half-ass this approach. And I, I've done that as much as I could. Like, you know, I cut out summer podcasts this year and in 2019, I'm going to compress down the podcast schedule some more because I'm, I'm constantly filtering through my context. What is most important? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. I I have felt the same way about. Um, I think that when we were talking about when, like when a book like really grips you, I think that what's happening is a little bit of like confirmation bias, and that these authors are just articulating an idea that is that is just is just forming in your mind, like it's it's almost there. But then you read this and you're like, oh, of course, this is exactly what I was already thinking. Exactly, exactly. You know, and one one key takeaway that another one that comes to mind is. The idea of he said something, and this is what a lot of people say too. You know, if you could be really good at one thing, what would that be? And this is something I struggle with now of like, do I have too many irons in the fire? Am I doing too much? And I think in social media, with Instagram and YouTube out there, we're at no shortage of ideas. And you have people like me, like you, like Stephen Pressfield, encouraging people to chase the ideas. But then you need somebody eventually like a Greg to come in and say, take this basket of ideas you have and all these irons in the fire and start to refine that down. Because if you want to be truly great as a person, the best you that you can be, that's going to mean doing something really well. And that something is, is probably one thing or a very small list of things, not a lot of things. Yeah, I think this kind of ties in with um, my next pick for my book. And it's probably, this is probably my favorite book. I have a tough time picking favorites, but I think that if I was gun to my head, this would probably be it. It's a Mastery by Robert Greene. And in it, it's, he talks about the road to becoming um, a master craftsman. And this was, this was, yeah, this was a book that just really truly gripped me when I first started reading it. This was right, but I think I started reading this right as soon as I was um, kind of getting into the whole sustainable farming thing and trying to figure it out and it just like it laid out this roadmap about how I was going to um, find my path and get good at this like you were like you were just talking about getting good at like this one thing but if that one thing is like really complicated like farming is not just one thing right it's a whole bunch of little tiny micro skills so it's like how can you get all these little micro skills up to a point where um, you end up being like a master farmer or not that that's a thing but yeah, a master, a master of your craft. And um, one thing that Robert Greene does, like it's his, it's his, I think it's his greatest gift is um, he picks really good stories. So he'll pick people from history and tell the story of how to become a master through all these different people, um, um, old school and contemporary about who have achieved mastery or who are on their way to mastery. So he has stories from uh, like people like Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Napoleon, um, Darwin, Edison, Martha Graham, Freddie Roach, um, and it, yeah, he talks about um, he talks about first like going through this apprenticeship phase, um, and then finding mentors. Uh, he talks about the the importance of social intelligence, which I don't really think uh, kind of gets discussed enough, like dealing with people, not just being like a, a superstar talent, right? And then um, he has this one thing in it that I thought was uh, really super interesting. Uh, he he talks about this thing called the, the dimensional mind, and I think it's really important. Um, I think it's um, kind of almost has some similarities to permaculture in the sense that he talks about taking two different skills and combining them into something new. So it's kind of the things like it's the it, it's becoming um, good an apprentice at a basic skill and then combining it to um, yeah to elevate yourself in your field and become a true master. Do you think that book is more suited for say somebody who's in a position like me where you know, you found your stride, you have a few things, and then that takes you to the next step with those few things where maybe you refine that down and you just become the, no pun intended, master of them? Or is it for somebody who's, you know, just trying to figure their stuff out? No, it's both. Because because the book progr- uh, the, the book profiles the whole journey all along the way. So 
So you might you might be you would probably read the first half about um, you would be learning about like how Darwin went out into the into the um, Darwin went out and he went out to the countryside and he was like he was just fascinated with like natural life and he would just draw them and stuff and then um, you you'll learn about that right and he like he put himself through like his own apprenticeship phase basically by going out and studying and acquiring all these skills that he would later use when he went on the Beagle and um, I think that you would probably read that and. Th- think back in time and think, oh yeah, I've already done this. But then when you got to the point where um, he was talking about like the, the dimensional mind and creating and combining these new skills together, then you would really start to probably have that confirmation bias and be like, oh, this was a, this is what I was thinking at. This was a, what I was just grasping at. But now it kind of seems more tangible. You know, Robert Greene, he's written a lot of books. 48 Laws of Power is one I have in my library. I I haven't listened to it. I've started and failed a few times on that one. I'm not prepared to give up on it. Of the books of his, have you listened to others? And why does this stand out if it's this one versus others? I've read all of his books and I really like them all. This one and he's got one, it's it's a, it's a the 50th Law and it's a book about 50 Cent, but it's also like really good. It's probably tied with mastery. But um, this one stands out just because it just, I guess for me, it was just that whole confirmation bias thing that really happened because it just came to me, this book came to me at the right time. Um it has it has so much depth in it in that I definitely this is a book this is one of the books that I read every single year and sometimes when I'm listening to an audiobook um, I'll get a thought from the audiobook and I'll have to pause the audiobook and just like just let that thought um, just percolate in my mind and kind of take over and that doesn't happen very often to me when I'm reading a book like normally I just press play do what I'm doing and that's it but there's some certain books that I'll have to pause and listen to and really think about it. And when I'm listening back to mastery, I still pause it every single time, usually multiple times. So it's like, it's just a good book has depth to it and you can take out different things to it out out of different times. Like, like sometimes a book will be about an idea. Like you were saying, like about grit and you read it and you're like, okay, I already get that idea. Right. Okay. Resistance. I get that idea. But with mastery, there's so much to it that there's no way that you can take it all in in one time and the stories that he he picks stories from from all different people from all different walks of life um he's got he's got men he's got women he's got um people from history he's got contemporary people and so it's just really it's really just this it's it's like it's his probably his master work honestly um now that i've read all his other stuff but it's it's a uh, yeah it's just it's just got a lot of depth to it i'll have to check that one out because i i have not read it and thinking of this idea that you know you mentioned of Books finding you at the right point in time. And this is something I want to, I, I totally agree. And I think it's really important for anybody, whether you're reading or listening to these books to just acknowledge going in, like some books are going to resonate with you now and some books aren't going to, and you come back a year later and they might be totally reversed. I think you need to go out when you're exploring books and you find stuff that grips you now And then ride the wave because, I mean, you can probably attest to this, Scott. Once you find one book, say you lead off with mastery and you're into that, now you go look at other Robert Greene books or you look at some of the other books in that category and that kind of gets your trajectory started. But if you're going to select a first book, don't force feed it in. Don't listen to mastery just because Scott said to listen to it. Let mastery make you want to listen to it. Totally. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that like, yeah, there's been certain books, especially when I was starting out where, you know, you just start listening to it. And it's just, yeah, that's like, that's what I wanted to be doing. I wanted to be listening to that book. There was nothing else I wanted to be doing. I just wanted to figure out what was what was in this book. Right. You know, and, and one thing I've learned kind of of listening to books, and this ties into my second one on the list is it's Marie Kondo's The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And she talks about this with physical books. Sometimes you buy a physical book at a point in time in life when you need a book. And you read the book, get rid of the book. Like, it serves a purpose then. You don't necessarily need to store it. You may never need to go back to it. And when I look at all the books on my list, I mean, honestly, I think this is the one that had the biggest impression on my life. Like, Marie Kondo's fingerprints are all over our household because this is essentialism for stuff. This is looking at everything you have and saying, does this spark joy? 
what is most important. I only want to keep what is most important. And not that I was ever a hoarder, but I would definitely keep stuff thinking, oh, this is sentimental or one day I'll use this thing. And she, I guess, said something I always knew, but it just hit me in the right way to say like, that's all BS. It either is important now for you to have this or it's not. There's no maybe, there's no in between. Get rid of it if you don't need it and keep it if you do. And over the last year and a half, I have gotten rid of so much stuff that it's unbelievable. So that's why this one made it onto my list. Have you ever read that one? I, I haven't read that one. That That's kind of funny because that that's one of the ones where I felt that that one I would have picked up a little bit too late. I was already I was already life changing magic. I was tidying up, man. I was throwing stuff out. I didn't have any problems. I kind of just um what does she say what if it sparks joy, the right? When yeah, she, exactly. When you pick it up? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I kind of already I had kind of already been over that. I was already like I I would have probably needed to read that book like six months prior to when I you know, I found out about it. But yeah, I I I, I full heartedly believe in the philosophy behind it. And there's a lot of little things in there, you know, of that I've learned, like, you know, farmers are notorious for this because you got land, you have corners, you have barns, you have sheds where you can keep stuff. And it's all like, hey, I bought this. I don't want to get rid of it. Or I'm going to save this for a future project. And how many of those future projects, if you look back on life, they just never happen because life changes and the projects aren't a priority anymore or interesting. So you get rid of stuff. That's one thing. You know, another big takeaway there is you start now and you do it all at once. Like she is not a fan of like, today I'm going to get rid of one thing. Tomorrow I'm going to get rid of one thing. It's like, no, today you get rid of all of it and you do it at once and you look at each item. Does it spark joy? And the hardest one, and this is, this is really hard having kids is it's okay to get rid of sentimental stuff. And so when my kids make something or there's something that like my parents sent me out a box of stuff I made when I was five, or there's something my parents gave me when I was five. And a lot of us, we have these little trinkets and they sit in boxes in our garage or a closet. And we think, well, this item has meaning because, you know, my grandma gave me this before I died. And I think the biggest probably the biggest realization that I had is like the item is not what is sentimental. When someone gave you that item or when you created that item, that item became a part of who you are. And that is what's carried with you now. And it became a piece of who you are today. It's like for a while I saved the first dollar I made on my paper route when I was 12 years old. And it and that dollar really made, made me proud then to see it. But now, you know, 38 years old, to look at that dollar, it's like, what's the point? But the dollar itself didn't represent anything. It was just a building block in who I am and I carried it with me. I don't need the dollar. The dollar is me. And... When I started looking at sentimental objects like that, suddenly it became get rid of the clutter. If it's super special, it needs to be where it can be enjoyed on display, where it can be handled, where it can be used. Otherwise, just get rid of it because it is a form of emotional baggage. Yeah, I had a pretty much a whole house of stuff. And I sold my house at the beginning of the year and really downsized a whole bunch of stuff. Like that was kind of, you know, the time if you're going to throw stuff out, throw it out. And um, I'm sitting in my room and I pretty much got a room full of stuff and nothing else. And I could not, I couldn't tell you five items that I threw out. Like if I had to, I, I don't think I could tell you like what, what what the five, like, you know, most sentimental items I threw. I threw lots of stuff out. I threw tons of stuff out, you know, stuff that I've been hanging on to for years. And I don't even, I couldn't, I can't even remember right now some of them, um, like what they were. So it's, it's kind of funny how uh, you think that, yeah, you think that the, the memory is the thing, but it's not. And when you have kids, you know, kids make a lot of stuff. They give you a lot of stuff. And it ties into another idea in that book of 
the giving of something or the acquisition of something or the purchase of something is sometimes the sole mission of that thing. If a child creates something and gives that to you, they're happy giving it to you. You should be happy that they're happy that they gave it to you. You don't necessarily have to keep it. Like I have stuff in my looking around where I'm recording my podcast drawings my daughter did three years ago. She's never going to remember that she even did that drawing. But I keep it around and, and really do I have to. And like I was talking to my wife about this today actually around um, somebody we know who bought some stuff. And sometimes like buying something that you want to buy, even if you never use it, the the purpose of the thing you bought was you fulfilled that like mental need to say like I wanted that thing and I bought it. And if you throw it in the trash, it's fulfilled its whole purpose. And, and that's tough. But this is one of those things that we have a lot of stuff in our life, mentally and physically, and the more you can get out, the more you can focus on the people and the things that really matter. And, and the biggest one, like, too, that I've realized, too, is, like, photos are a waste. How often do people go back and look at all the photos that they take? And I cringe when I go to my daughter's activities and I see people just moms and stuff taking videos and photos that no one is ever going to watch and you are displacing you absorbing an experience through your own eyes. Instead, you're looking through a screen to capture something that you're never going to go back and see. So stop taking photos, use your memory and Life will become easier, I think Marie Kondo says, and things will work out if you're lacking something. You know, just be surrounded by the stuff that makes you happy. So that was my number two, your number three. My number three is Extreme Ownership by Jocko Wilnick and Leif Babin. And um, back, I used to do MMA a long time ago, whatever, six, seven years ago. And um, I was not very good at it at the beginning. And I got a little bit better. And near the end, I thought that I was going to have these last couple of fights. I was going to win them. And then I was just going to quit and be awesome. And um, we had this really high level coach come up from, um, from Vegas. And he came up and taught me a whole bunch of stuff. And um, all this stuff that was outside of my control started happening. Um, like this, this coach taught me all about how to structure a game plan. And he told me to watch out for a guillotine choke. It's just a choke, but because uh, I have a long neck. And he told me um, all this different stuff about how like you should be structuring your training camp to build up confidence. And I didn't. Um, I when I voiced how I wanted to train in the gym, no one wanted to do it that way. And so we didn't do it that way. And then on fight night, um, I got choked out in like a minute, and I woke up in the middle of the ring, um, and it was like it was you know this was supposed to be like my comeback fight. And uh, it just went as poorly as I could have possibly um, ever have thought that it would have went. Um, flash forward a little bit, six months. Um, I just had this chip on my shoulder and I was just like, I'm just going to do everything the way that I thought that I should. And I took like total ownership of this whole situation. And my last two fights, um, I ended up doing like the complete opposite. I did, <laughs> did way better. One, my last fight was um, my last fight was like in front of my hometown um, and everybody was there and it was like, I won my fight in front of like all my family and friends. And it was like this whole like big moment for me. And it was like really cool. And, um, yeah, I had like taken control of all these things that were like outside of my control. I just, I just owned everything. Like if, if, if something wasn't happening, I just, I just took care of it. Right. If like whatever. And that's what this whole book is about. It's about taking ownership. It's called extreme ownership. And, um, Jocko and Leif were Navy SEALs and they went and fought in, um, Iraq in 2007 and they take leadership principles that they learned on the battlefield um you know in the most hostile um kind of environment that the man can be in um close quarters combat and they take um a lesson that they learned on the battlefield and then they take um a business example from life and they show how that the principle that they learned in combat applies to regular life and it's just these 12 um these 12 bullets points basically about how to um be extreme how to live extreme ownership 
how to just take control of everything, how to uh, own up for everything. And it really, that was like one of those things that, it was one of those things that when I, I read this book, I just quickly went back to fighting and I was like, wow, that's that's all the stuff, that's all the stuff that I learned in fighting in just in this little short book. And it was just, I was just like, yeah, it's awesome. So is it like, I suck at baseball, don't blame the ball or the field, blame myself. And if I want to get better, it's up to me. Yeah, pretty much. And like, obviously there's going to be stuff outside of your control, but yeah, but you can pretty much, you can pretty much do everything and they have like a, yeah, you got to take control of what you control. So if like, if you want to do that baseball example, you know, you can control what you eat, you control your time in the gym, you control how much you practice, right? Um, You can be there for your team members so that they'll put in time with you. You can be nice to the coaches so that they'll be, they'll be kind to you, right? You'd be a good team player. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, hopefully you're hitting some, smashing some dingers. You know, he's somebody who's blown up in the past few years. What do you think is it about his, I'll call it philosophy, that resonates with so many people out there? I think he speaks his truth. I think he's, and he's very articulate as well. Uh, he's like an English major. So I think that he speaks his truth though. And I think that that people um, people are drawn to the authenticity of it because he's speaking, he's speaking a certain truth. He's lived that and now he's trying to help other people. So I think that there's... Um, I think there's, he's, yeah, he's just a powerful person that's in a good position to do good. Like if he, he's, the, he, he's just a, it's like when there's a strong person like that, that, um, you know, you, you see a Navy SEAL and you think like, okay, this guy's going to destroy everyone and stuff. And then he's, you know, very kind and articulate and well-read and, and carries a lot of wisdom. Um, there's something to be said for that when um, I think when someone kind of doesn't show up how you expect them to. And for somebody who's listened to this in the farm space, running their own business, what's a what's a takeaway transposed onto a farm business? Like number six would be like keep things simple. So like keep your plans simple so they can be easily communicated, understood, and adjusted in response to real time changes. And so the example that he gave, I remember the combat example. The combat example he gave in the book was that um, there was going to be these new guys coming in with 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 their troops in their little in their um in their group. And uh, this new guy came in and he was trying to give everyone like really complicated instructions, but all these different radio um, frequencies were overlapping. And he's just like, no, he's like, how about for the first time, we just have you go out there 90 meters, turn around and come back in. And so they did that and they went out like 10 meters and they got engaged with the enemy right away. And it was like, it just turned into like a show right away. And so then... um, so then they would provide like a business example about how somebody in business was like trying to have like this super complicated like 34 point plan about adjusting widgets and how that was going to impact people's bonuses but it wasn't like it wasn't affecting um it wasn't affecting like what the change that they wanted to see happening and they just said no like keep things simple and then they just implemented like this simple plan in the business and then it happened so i think like that's something that you could take away from farming is like you have all these crazy plans that you want to do. Like, you know, I'm going to have like a 15 year crop rotation, but then it's like, no, you just got to, maybe you should just do the crop rotation that you can do this year. When you're mentioning that, I mean, you're talking bullet points. So you're looking at something. When you listen to an audio book, do you write down notes? Do you write down thoughts on it? Or is it straight absorption and that's it? It's mostly absorption. I usually don't do bullet points and stuff. Um, I'll go back and like look at something sometimes. Like for this for this conversation, I've got like um, summaries pulled up that because I knew like that I was going to want to refer to stuff. What about you? Yeah, same thing. I I just listen. I figure whatever you know to quote Paulo Coelho, whatever is going to stick is going to stick, and I'm not going to try and waste trying to pull out what I think is important as I hear it. It's like, I'll just hear it, my brain will internalize it, and it'll determine what's important and my actions will react off of that. Like, I've, I've, I listen to a lot of sci-fi and I look at our brain as a supercomputer that has more capacity than we know. And when we try and outthink it, I think we do ourselves injustice, which is, again, why I love the audiobook at high speed because it can go from my ears to my brain and my brain can sort out the mess versus, you know, my critical logical thinking trying to get in there and say, oh, pay attention to this, not this. It's good. Thinking of Jocko Willick, he's a Navy SEAL, fought in Iraq, you know, part of history. And for my third one, I, I kind of cheated a little bit and I, I called it biographies of great figures in history. 
because I didn't want somebody to say, oh, go listen to this one on Winston Churchill or James Garfield. I think I'm trying to approach, give you an idea of how I approach biographies. And a lot of the biographies I listen to are, say, 1860 to 1920. For I just like that period in history, and I listen to a lot. And one of the big takeaways I've listened to, or one of the big takeaways that's came out of me listening to a lot of audiobooks in this, and this is a lot, this is a big category for me, like there's 40 books probably in this category, is you have a, a window in life to be truly great at one thing. And as you, life evolves and life changes, that, that window either shrinks or more windows open and it's just harder to focus on one thing. The people that made profound impacts dedicated their life to one thing. Marconi, Tesla, Edison, Theodore Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, like they were all in. And the governmental ones definitely had opportunity as they went on in life. But a lot of people like Marconi in their 20s, like they worked on what they did nonstop. And it's a little sobering for me to think about this because I went through my 20s kind of dabbling and trying to figure it out. And I feel like I expensed that window um, because now like I have a family and I can't make that singular targeted impact as much of one as somebody who is has all their time to dedicate into one thing. And I, I'm okay with that. Because another trend that I think you see in a lot of these biographies is great men are not great fathers. Um, at least how I perceive a, what what a great father should be because it's really hard to dedicate your life's work to figuring out something that is a total unknown. Like if you want to go, you know, make an interstellar spaceship right now, like you're in that 24 seven and to try and raise kids alongside that is going to be really tough. Like it's just not going to happen. And for a lot of people, like that's a hard decision to do I go family or do I go my career? And everybody, if you're going to have a family at some point, is going to have to make that decision. So I go look at people like you, like you're in that window where it's do everything that Scott can to be what Scott wants to be. Because if you jump into my window, it's a lot harder. Like I have, I have boundaries that you don't have. Yeah. I think, I think about it a lot too. I think about it all the time. That's like, that's kind of a constant thing in my mind is like, am I doing enough? Am I doing enough? Cause I don't, I also think that, um, I also kind of think that when you have kids that you realize that how much time that that takes, like, it's almost like that, um, you realize how much time you had before, you know what I mean? And I don't really have a taste of, of like of that being taken away from me. Like when I'm reading these biographies and stuff, um, a lot of these guys had brushes with death or early childhood ailments and they thought that they were going to die and they thought they were going to die early. And because of that, they just started hustling. Like they started going hard. And um, yeah, it was just like super, super interesting. I think about that quite a lot though too. Yeah. And, you know, I think as a dad or as a parent, you know, mother, father, doesn't matter. Part of how I view being a great parent is you have to give up a part of your life for them. Meaning you're going to consciously decide at some point that thing that I wanted to dedicate my life to, I'm going to back off on it or I'm not going to do it because you're important and your what you've done up to that point then gets kind of distilled into them and, that's hard. Like it, it, it's very hard kind of shutting the door on things. And I just hear in some of these biographies, what some of these, you know, great inventors and people have done. And not that I ever want to do that, or I feel guilty about doing that, but I'm just like, damn, like if somebody had just beat this into my head when I was 18, what 
would life look like now? Because I didn't have that. Like, I, nobody told me, like, get on the hustle now. Because eventually, like, you're in a different station and the train looks completely different. Yeah, I know. I always, I wish that I had, like, started, I wish I had started doing stuff earlier, too. Like, I, I think it's just, I think it's just in hindsight, it's just what most of, what most of us going through. I think one thing is that, uh, I think you're definitely right with that they've, the, all these great people in history have pretty much given up something. They gave up something. And for a lot of those people, it was family. So, uh, you know, family's your priority. You probably, you're probably going to have to give up something to get there. Right. And a lot of these people, I mean, like they chose to be great. And this is where, like you hear this whole idea of privilege, right? And like, I get privilege exists out there, but privilege is nothing without work because Winston Churchill came from aristocracy he volunteered to go into the Boer War. He put himself in wartime situations because it, he thought it was what he had to do. He ch chose to make that decision. Theodore Roosevelt came from a very rich New York family, could have gone the route of his brother who eventually died of alcoholism and just done nothing. But he used his, quote, privilege as a platform to do more. And I think... You know, society loves to, to target shoot at these people that, you know, are starting off ahead of us or, you know, who are, you're lower than somebody else. And like, oh, look what they're starting with. And that's not it. Because all these examples, there's always siblings that suck at life and are degenerates. And there's the, the siblings that make a conscious effort to take the hard route, you know, putting themselves literally in harm's way, volunteering to potentially die. When they could have lived the easy life. And I think that's a major takeaway for me through a lot of these biographies is it doesn't matter what you start with. That helps you get to the next level, but you have to put in the work to move from that platform to the next platform. And if you want to make a difference in the world, just go from where you are, have dedication to one thing and get after it because the easy route is never the successful route i know the easy route of all these rich families is you know people die for stupid stuff yeah and in robert green's book master he says that um you're a unique you're a unique um set of neurons you're your own unique set of dna at a certain point um in history with a certain set of experiences and all those things have convalesced to bring you to where you are now. And I think that all of those people throughout history took advantage of, of those three things and, um, yeah, really tried to make something of themselves. Get after it, do your thing, but then also realize that trade-offs are going to be made. So if I look at kind of these first three book, three categories or three books, I mean, this is, this is the struggle that I face as a parent. I mean, it's, it's paring back stuff. It's paring back focus on certain activities to allow myself more time to do other things. And I look at what some of these people have done in the past and just say, well, what's more important to me? Is it, is it to make an impact on my business? Is it to make an impact on the world? Or is it to make an impact on three little girls in my life that if I only impact them, but I impact them greatly, is that more profound than if I change the lives of a million people? Something I have to work on. Hard questions to answer. So your your number four. Uh, my number four is The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. Uh, this was a book that I heard about. Um, he, Ryan actually uh, apprenticed for Robert Greene when he was writing that mastery book. He was one of his research assistants. So Robert taught him some keys to how to organize, pick good stories, and he did a really good job on this. Um, this is a book that kind of made um, the philosophy of Stoicism started to blow up a little bit and came out in the in the 2014. And it was based on this quote from Marcus Aurelius. It says, uh, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. Yeah, it's called The Timeless Art of Turning uh, Trials and Triumph. And he breaks the book up into three different parts, um, perception, action, and will. But he takes stories throughout history of, uh, you know, Ulysses S. Grant, Thomas Edison, Margaret Thatcher, Amelia Earhart, and he tells about how these people came across these, uh, uh, you know, immovable obstacles and really um, spun them around and turned them into their favor instead. 
how would that differ from, say, the War of Art and the Resistance? Uh, well, I think that the War of Art is kind of a little bit more of just like it's a little bit more um, impersonal. This one's like this one's like you have obstacles and you're going to need to find a way to get around them. This um, this book really helped me out a lot. Um, my first year farming, I was going to go in this farmer's market. I thought I was going to go into it two weeks before that they were going to two weeks before they're supposed to start. They emailed me and said, um, I'm sorry, based on your selection, uh, crop selection this year, we're not going to be able to offer you a spot in the market. And um, I thought that this line was in the book, but I never found it in there since I've read it. But I, I thought, to my, I had just read this book and I thought to myself, like, this isn't bad. This is just different. This is like, it's my perception of how I'm perceiving this. Like, because right away, I wanted to start to color that experience negative. I wanted to say like, oh, like, like these guys screwed me over and like the, all this bad stuff happened to me. But instead, I just... I just realized that the thing that itself wasn't that bad. It was just a thing. It was just happening. It, well, there was no negative connotations attached to it. There was no positive connotations attached to it. it. It was just it was just what happened. And that allowed me to really process it like within like two minutes and start to move on my next thing. And um, yeah, it was just like it was just like this. It was I when I first read the book, I didn't like I thought it was a good book, but I didn't really like didn't like thought i'd take so much out of it and then when that happened i was like wow that book helped me out so much it was like it was just this really cool thing yeah, it's one i've never read i haven't read any of his books they're short his he's um he's a really gifted author he's he his books are short but yeah he really learned um the art of picking good stories from from robert and um yeah he tells he tells really good i was i was very tossed up between um between this and his other book there's another book called ego is the enemy and it's just about um, it's about being humble and when your ego can get in the way. And uh, I think both I think both those books are they're really good. They're like my top books. Yeah, worth checking out. And it, it's interesting here in these you know six so far, they're very much echoing ideas that we had going into this. And it's just it's almost confidence building, or it's a little bit of extra pushing to do the next thing or to work through experiences. And you know it, I know it from running a business is you're going to have challenges when you run a business. And sometimes you can feel very isolated. And these books, or if you're hearing about people of history that have overcame these types of challenges, you start to feel not alone. Uh, I feel empowered about doing this. And I start to be like, well, if they did it. I want to do it. And, you know, Teddy did it. I want to be in the same category as Teddy. So let's get after it. Cool. What's your next one? A big part of my reason for audiobooks is definitely motivation and inspiration. But I think, you know, if I had to graph this on a pie, I probably listen to more fiction than I listen to nonfiction now. Because I need a way to not think about business, to not think about do I have enough time to do stuff with my kids? Like I need a de-stressor and I need a way to zone out and tune out. And the only really effective way I found to do that is to put on headphones and put on a good fiction book where it's like literally the world goes away and I can immerse myself in that story. So I seek out a lot of fiction a lot of the stuff I listen to is is modern sci-fi, although I listen to some classic sci-fi and, and kind of thriller and suspense type books. And I was trying to think, okay, well, how do I distill this down into something that might be interesting for people? Because a lot of this material is, is very subjective. And the one I have is, it's a sci-fi book. But it's very different than a lot of sci-fi out there. A lot of sci-fi, space sci-fi, is, you know, humans going to someplace else, fighting some sort of enemy, and it's very technology-driven, and that stuff's great. There's a lot of series in there that I love. But the one I have is, is Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky. And it's different sci-fi, and it's dramatically different than anything out there. And it will make you think... And I'm going to try and talk about this in the next one without sp spoilers happening here. But it talks about a biological future versus a technological future. And 
there's one theme in there of, and I think this could apply to regular life of what if you simply change your mind from no to yes? So if you were afraid of snakes and there were snakes everywhere, what if all of a sudden like snakes weren't scary to you? How would your life be different? Or if you thought, man, like I'm, I'm so oppressed by the system. If suddenly your view was, man, the system empowers me or I'm not oppressed by the system, how much would your life change? And that, that's kind of a core tenant here. But if you, if, for somebody who's never listened to sci-fi, it may be a little tough because the beginning's a little slow. But if you're at all interested in different stuff, that book is a great one. He's won a whole bunch of awards for that book. I wish he had a sequel or another book like it, but he doesn't. Does the author read that book or is it like a cast? It's a female narrator and I think she's good for the role. Yeah, that's um that's something that I didn't um think that would happen with audiobooks is that sometimes you can get like a full cast rendition of of an audiobook. And I don't know if you've listened to any of those, but but it's pretty cool when there's like characters will have like their own voices. Um yeah, it's just really neat. Generally, I try and shy away from those. I like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like one reader who can read it well. Done. Yeah, yeah. I just, it just, I don't know. I think it, it listens better to me. Yeah. But this is one I re, went back and re-listened to recently. So I've heard this two times, uh, literally about a year apart. I first heard it about a year ago. Um, but some great concepts in there, especially given that a lot of people are in this, are involved in farming, maybe have a permaculture background. Some, some takeaways and other ones are like there's a intrinsic interconnectivity between all things. And you can use and work with that interconnectivity versus trying to destroy it. And I think whether that's politics or competitors, there's a lot of takeaways from that. And another one is sometimes all it takes to solve a problem is a new perspective. Like we get so set in our way of how things are going to be or how they should be that we may miss radical, different and better solutions that we close ourselves off to. So Children of Time, Adrian Tchaikovsky, check it out. That's really cool. Um, my last book, I also went with a fiction book. And I think that fiction sometimes, like you were just talking about, reveals truth that um, is not necessarily true in the same way that just an idea, just presenting an idea. If you just write it out, like say like even that grip book that we were talking about earlier, like you just write out that idea. But sometimes when you have, um, when you tell a story, you can you can really dig down and it's kind of like the layers that I was talking about before. And um, I picked The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. Have you read that book? I have. I've read it physically several times i have the audiobook and it's one i've never listened to the audiobook on because i've just always kind of had sentiment with reading it i read this book in high school and then i came back to it and i was just kind of i was like i liked it in high school but this when i read it by myself uh yeah i was really gripped by it and um yeah i was kind of just blown away by it by some of the ideas in it uh it's about um it's about a family that's living in in oklahoma um during the dust bowl and they get set out on the land and and right away, John Steinbeck's got some, he's got some really good line. Like there's, when I, I've read most of John Steinbeck's stuff now, but um, there's, there'll be some certain lines in it when he was talking about, he was talking about sharecroppers and he was talking about how these guys started to work the fields with tractors. And as soon as they got on the tractors, then they became disconnected with the land because they were, they were farming, they were doing too much. And it was just like, it was just all these things that I've learned about farming and stuff. And I was just like, it was just very captivating, but tells a story about these people from Oklahoma. They get caught in the Dust Bowl. They got nothing. Everything's everything's going to crap. So they set out for California um, thinking there's going to be work out there. And it just goes bad. And it's this, this story about how this family, um, who didn't necessarily do anything wrong, um, gets caught into a terrible situation. And about, um, about how poor people come together. And um, it's just like, it's really beautiful. <laughs> I was just crying at the end. It's a great story. I, for some reason, I've always identified with Tom Choad uh, ever since I first read it in high school myself. You know, when you look at fiction books, how much of that is your makeup of audiobook consumption? I would say less than 20. I would say I, I, I normally, I've only been reading 
fiction for the past uh, year. I'm, I really started to try to go through the classic fiction more. Um, John Steinbeck, uh, Ernest Hemingway. Um, and then I kind of found out that I really like uh, Neil Gaiman. Uh, he's got some really good fiction audiobooks. He's got this one called like Norse Gods and a couple other ones. But yeah, mostly, mostly I don't, um, mostly I don't read fiction, but I'm, I'm becoming more open to it. Like I just added that, I added that Children of Time one to my Audible. Okay. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. I mean, I try and approach it with, you know, I look at audiobooks as a way to a continuing education, but sometimes like I can only force feed myself so much like self development stuff. And like, I'm just not feeling it. I, like, I can't do five of those books back to back. And it's just like, well, I want to break it up. Um, what else could I listen to? Yeah. When I first started listening to the books and we were talking about like that, spending 20 bucks or whatever, you want to make sure you get the value out of it. And, um, but now I realize that I do get value out of it. It's just a different form of value than maybe that I have like a three bullet point list that I can take out of it. Yeah. And some of these fiction books, like, I mean, I, I get addicted to them. Like there are binge worthy, like Game of Thrones or some other Netflix series out there. Um, like I cannot stop listening. Like it's almost like, do not talk to me. I want to listen to this audio book. Yeah. I was, um, I got a job last year at, the, at, a, at this golf course and I was driving around on mowers and I could listen to books all the time. And I, would, I would like go to work just so I could listen to Harry Potter. Cause I bought all seven. I was just like, I was just burning through them. I was just having the best time. Yeah, and and this last one of mine is one that I started uh, driving back from Phoenix one time, and I aborted it. I'm like, eh, I'm just kind of done. It's like it's slow to start, and then I'm like, you know what? Like I bought this thing. I, I think it's going to be good. It's got good reviews. I'm going to go all in on it and just tough through, like get it to the point where it's interesting, and it did. Uh, I got caught up in it. It's a three book series. It's the series by Jason Matthews, it's The Red Sparrow, The Palace of Treason, and The Kremlin's Candidate. Another one where I don't want to give away endings, but it is an amazingly strong story, strong character development, probably more so than any fiction book that I have listened to, to the point where like, I felt like I was in the story, and when it ended, it felt personal to me. Like I felt like I had lived it and I was associated with the characters and it emotionally affected me as crazy as that sounds. But that is one that I don't know if I'll find a fiction one that resonates that much with me. Um, it just became a part of me. And it was a truly like, again, why I go to fiction to escape, to be all in on the book, to enjoy it. It's a good one, and it's long too. Like that might be sixty hours in all three three of the books. Uh, is it like sci-fi or what? No, it's modern spy, spy thriller. I guess you could say, um, based upon like espionage, uh, U.S. Russia type thing. And that's really a category of books that you know. When I look at fiction, there's sci-fi. There's a couple authors there that I really follow. And when it gets into the thrillers, I kind of like these spy novels. I, I scour for stuff and it, it's those fiction. I think it's critical to find a good narrator and good is going to be different for everybody. Like you just got to find a, a narrator that resonates with you because they make all the difference. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Once you start getting into it, it's just like this never ending. It just never ends. Thousands and thousands of books out there on Audible. I just got some new ones that I'm going to check out. It's exciting. And it's a world that I think... People, again, should be exposed to. Uh, is there anything you have in your list that hasn't been brought up in this conversation that you have not listened to, but you're looking forward to listening to? Well, I've um, I've been going through uh, Yuval Noah Harari's books, the guy that wrote Sapiens. He's wrote two other books that um, I've been following up with. So he's got Homo Duez and he's got this other one called uh, 21 Lessons for 21st Century. And um, I think that I think that he is he's a brilliant thinker, like like Ryan Holiday's books. He's a good writer, but Ryan is just regurgitating someone else's ideas. Whereas like Yuval Noah Harari and like Nassim Nicholas Taleb are talking about new ideas in a very complex way. And um, so, yeah, I've been I've been after I read Sapiens um, that Yuval Noah Harari, I'll pretty much I'll I'll read anything that he writes now. So I'm looking forward to those. Yeah. What about you? 
Well, for this, I, I mean, I'll go with one that I am curious about. I don't know that I'm excited about it. I don't know that I have high expectations for it, but I've heard enough about this person that finally I'm like, I see the book on sale. I'm going to pop and buy it. It's High Performance Habits by Brendan Burchard. I haven't read any of his stuff, but he's somebody I hear echoed quite a bit. And I think some of the echoing kind of gets thrown into that motivational kind of sleazy realm. But I've heard enough good things that I wanted to check out his book. So that's one that you know, I'll be listening to before this one airs coming up. So all in, I want to thank you, Scott, for taking some time to chat about this. And if people like this format or want book recommendations, where can they go to give some feedback and reach out, pick your brain, and also follow along with what you're doing on YouTube and the farm? Uh, I'm on YouTube as Scott Hebert. You can uh, just search my name. There should be, find my channel. And um, on all the other social media, I'm at Flavorful Farms. There you have it, Scott Hebert and I on audiobooks. Be sure to follow along with everything that Scott is doing. He's putting out a lot of content on YouTube. You can follow along his day-to-day -day journey on the grind. As you heard in this episode, a lot of what he's doing in real life is driven by what he learns in audiobooks. So check him out, Scott Hebert, on YouTube, which I've also linked to in the show notes for this episode. If you have some great audiobooks that you'd like to recommend, I would love to hear them. As you heard in this episode, I'm an audiobook junkie. I'm always looking for a good suggestion. So I'd love to hear your audiobook recommendations. Send me an email, diego at permaculture voices, or hit me up on Instagram at Diego Footer and let me know what some of your favorite audiobooks are. Have a happy New Year's. Have a safe New Year's. I hope you have a great and productive 2019. It's really your year if you want it to be. We're all starting clean right now. So make 2019 everything you ever wanted it to be. Get after it. Crush it. And until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.